let us know your contact information. If you're a member of our church, of course, we love to have you back with us here in person, but thanks for joining us online when you cannot be with us in person. Uh, if you need follow-up information about our stewardship campaign, I want to ask you to contact by phone call or email our church office. We'd love to get out information to you if you have not yet received it as we move through these next couple Sundays of commitment. And we are blessed to have you with us. Also, for those of you who are with us in person, as well as those who are watching online, if you have not yet received or picked up a copy of the uh, Stewardship Family Devotional Guide, those of you who have children in your homes or grandchildren, by the way, uh, whom you'll be able to do this with, be sure to pick up your copies of the Family Devotional Guide for the Stewardship Season. We are in this Thanksgiving month and Thanksgiving season when it's so important to be committing ourselves to the Lord and talking with our children about what it means to put God first and to grow in faith and thankfulness and gratitude to the Lord. So we rejoice in that and I'm, I'm delighted we have this opportunity for you those of you who have children. Remember now, you, you may turn in your commitment cards over the next couple Sundays in uh, the offering, or if you'd like to, you can use one of our first connect cards. So I brought this up here to show you. And of course you have three, three cards, um, a giving card, a worship card, and a service card. Fill out each one of those as you plan for your spiritual growth and involvement in the church this year. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm going to invite um, Reed Robertson, our university ministry leader, to lead us in our call to worship as we come together today on All Saints Sunday. Reed, would you stand for the call to worship? This morning from Isaiah 25. And the Lord will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in salvation. Now would you remain standing as we do our affirmation of faith from the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. November 1st in the church year is All Saints Day, and this is All Saints Sunday, the first Sunday after All Saints. And we come together today and we give thanks for our saving faith, which is eternal through the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we specifically acknowledge and remember those who have gone before us joining the church triumphant in the past year. I'm going to read the names of those from our immediate church family active members who have joined the church triumphant in the last year. And if I fail to mention somebody that you would like me to mention, let me know. Uh, you can let me know before the end of the service. I'll include them in closing prayers or in forthcoming prayers and acknowledgement. But those who were active members on our roles who were uh, acknowledged as joining the church triumphant this year, they include Elizabeth Mallard Duffy, March 19th, James Marion McReynolds, Jr., April the 30th. Neil Amos, August the 18th. Roy Vernon Scott, August the 24th. And Molly Eccles, August the 25th. 
I'm going to read a passage from Romans chapter 14, which speaks to us not only in the call of the church triumphant in our eternal life with Jesus Christ, but also how we are to live as people are who are preparing by God's grace to join the church triumphant. You know, we're only here for a brief few moments here on earth. For none of us lives to himself and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or the, whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord of both the dead and of the living. The scripture says in the book of Revelation, blessed are those who die in the Lord. Yes, says the spirit, for they rest from their labors and their works follow them. Let us join together in a prayer of thanksgiving for Christ our Lord, the eternal Savior, and remembering and thanksgiving those who have served the Lord and joined the church triumphant. Let's pray together. Almighty God, eternal Father, by your grace, you have given your one and only Son that in him and through him and through his perfect life, his atoning death, and his victorious resurrection, we might live. And we give thanks for those who have gone before us in the faith, for Elizabeth, James, Neil, Roy, Molly, and Lord, for all those, that great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us in the faith, hold us, Lord, in the joy of our salvation, strongly steadfast that we might worship, give, serve faithfully as your stewards and your disciples here in these hours, in these days, in these years you give us. Looking ahead to the call of the church triumphant in your glory in eternity to come. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus, amen. Now, I invite you to stand and join in our hymn for this day, For All the Saints, verses 1, 2, and 5.
Thank you. Please be seated. And we give thanks to rejoice on this All Saints Sunday. We want to invite the children to come forward. And Miss Amy has a message for our children, as well as by extension to us, about Operation Christmas Child. Because just like we're in stewardship season and it's time to respond, it's also, we're kind of in crunch time for Operation Christmas Child, aren't we, Amy? While the children are still coming forward, um, there are still so many boxes downstairs that are ready and waiting to be picked up um, so that you can pack them at home. And I also have a prayer wall of photos that I, I posted today um, where you can choose a picture and write um, a prayer for that picture. Um, and that way we will cover Operation Christmas Child um, up until uh, collection week. Woohoo! I love seeing all these kiddos. I love it. Okay. So if you came to Sunday school this morning, you saw we were packing lots and lots of shoe boxes. We had toys and brushes and water bottles and notebooks and markers and crayons and more toys. It was lots of fun stuff. And you know what? These boxes are fun. They are fun. But do you know what? These simple boxes are also eternal. Not the box itself. I'm going to tell you why. Okay? First. When these shoe boxes go to boys and girls in different countries, we're able to share the gospel with them. We're able to share with them about Jesus. When we share the gospel with these boys and girls, we are giving them hope. We are giving them joy through the boxes. Wait just a minute, wait just a minute. We are giving them hope. We are giving them love. So many of these boys and girls, they don't ever get presents because their moms and dads only have money for, for food and shelter. When the local churches in these areas hand out these boxes, they're able to share with these boys and girls um, a wonderful thing called the greatest journey. And it talks with them about how to ask Jesus into your heart. And that is a wonderful thing right there. When these boys and girls hear about Jesus and they tell their friends about Jesus and they tell their families, it just keeps multiplying more and more and more people get to hear about Jesus. And lastly, when all those people hear about Jesus in all those different places, then we are growing the kingdom all around the world. And that's exactly what God calls us to do, to go and spread the good news. The main thing that we can do besides packing the boxes is to stop and pray. And so we're going to do that this morning. Pastor Martin is going to pray for us. Pastor Martin is going to pray for us. And so I want you to be praying all during the week. I gave your moms and dads prayer bookmarks so that you know the special things to pray for so that we make sure these aren't just fun boxes. These are eternal boxes. That's great. I mean, between these bookmarks for prayer, okay, and the stewardship prayer guide for families, we're actually going to be able to know as parents what to pray with our children about. I like it. It's pretty easy, right? Okay, let's pray together. Dear God, you guys pray with me now. Dear God, you're our Father in heaven. Every good thing comes from you. Help us to have your heart for other children and to help share your good news through Operation Christmas Child. And now we pray as your son teaches us. Our Father and in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen all right thank you children and thank you miss amy outside i think front steps for tlc and then probably downstairs you can go meet all right miss margaret thank you thank you
Again, we are blessed to be in the midpoint of our bicentennial year and uh, really taking stock and giving thanks for all the ways that God has blessed us. God has brought us and delivered us wonderfully, really wonderfully, through a trying season of the COVID uh, pandemic and all kinds of other uproar and, uh, you know, waves. Uh, during the last couple of years with our nation and our community, God has been so gracious and so good. And so many of you as stewards have been so faithful. Um, I have great news to share with you. Again, we are over the next couple Sundays, we'll be making our commitments on Commitment Sunday for regular worship, not only on Sunday morning, but during the week, okay? Regular prayer time and worship time with the Lord for our service to the Lord, uh, specifically connected with his church because the church is his key mission center that he sends out in the world. That's the Great Commission. And then also through your giving, through our giving to the Lord, his tenth, and then our further offerings and the joy and freedom of Jesus Christ. So we'll be turning in our cards. I have great news to share with you. Uh, really, this is the session and the board of directors have been blessed to make some major decisions over the last several months. One of the most important historic ones, really in a generation, uh, was the decision last Sunday at a special call meeting that your, your elders, our elders and our board of directors voted unanimously on the recommendation of the finance committee and the stewardship team to eliminate and pay off the debt that had been kind of the albatross around this church's neck for nearly 20 years, dating back to 2003. Uh, previous kind of sub-generations of our church and leadership had not been able to address this, but God made the way this year and this fall for us to address that debt that had been lingering over the church family. And so we're really here to celebrate this through a combination of a gift that was made shortly after I came here from a long, long time faithful member of our church, Frank Jackson, giving a house. Uh, he had an extra house that he gave and the proceeds from that were around $100,000 in the last six or so years. That The fund from that appreciated up to around $200,000. And it's amazing when you give to God how God can multiply that. And then through your regular giving in our operating cash surplus and investment surplus, we were able to combine this and the finance committee and uh, uh, administration team submitted this to the session. That debt is now gone. That's, that's been there since 2003. And so as we look ahead to make our commitments to worship and serve and yes, specifically to give, isn't it a joy to know that we're set free <laughs> from that old debt and that's really a testimony to the gospel in a larger sense. You know, the gospel is that story too. So we can give in the freedom of Jesus Christ this year in the celebration of that great news from God. You'll hear this again from me because I just think this was a historic moment in the middle of our bicentennial year. Isn't that awesome that God provided for us to do that? Uh, so again, be, be looking toward your commitments to give and to serve and to worship as we also bring to the Lord what is his, his tenth and our further offerings. And I'm going to invite Dean to give the call for God's tenth and our further offerings today. So in the family devotion packet that went out, it focuses on a verse from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 9, and it goes over a three-week kind of a, a three-devotion a three time period, however you decide to split that up. But I wanted to read two verses from 1 Chronicles 29, verse 6, and then verse 9, which is the one that the devotions are over. Verse 6 says this, Then the leaders of fathers' houses made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, and the officers over the king's work. And verse 9 says this, Then the people rejoiced, because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart, they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. So as we continue in our worship and we continue to just be thankful for that debt being paid off, for that amazing freedom that we have now, let us continue by bringing our tithes and our offerings and let's do it freely, willingly, and with a joyful heart. 
Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are our great father forever and ever. God, you have blessed us. You have blessed this church with the opportunity to pay off a debt that um, is a big debt. And God, we are thankful to you for that. Father, we are also thankful that you are our rock, our fortress, our redeemer. And God, we know that all that is in heaven and all that is in this earth is yours. Riches and honor all come from you. But Father, we ask for your forgiveness because we often hold on to the things of this world. We hold on to our possessions. We hold on to our positions, our influence, our wealth, our money, and all the things that that brings. Father, we ask for you to forgive us for that because you are over all these things. You are the one who makes our name great. So, Father, we pray that you will help us. Help us to give freely. Help us to give with our whole heart. Help us to give willingly and with a joyful heart our treasure, our time, and our talent. We pray this, Lord, to the glory of your name, and we ask that you will continue to multiply these gifts and use them for the spreading of your gospel message here and around the world. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, you call us to trust, to trust your plan, to trust in you. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and open us to live trusting you and to live in the fruit and the faithfulness of trusting you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thrilled that the choir was able to pull together that anthem for today as our sermon today is, of course, trust God's plan. Now, this is a running theme through the entire Bible and definitely in the book of Isaiah, the call to trust the Lord. So we'll return to that today as we look at some scripture from the close of Isaiah chapter 48, which is a bridge to um, the second major servant prophecy in Isaiah 49, this trust, trust issue. You know, in the Bible, the term trust and the Hebrew and Greek terms for trust are often used for um, actionable faith. This reminds me, uh, 
you know, of the story about the guy who is on the building that's on fire. And uh, the, the firemen throw a rope to the man and they say, all you have to do is grab hold of this rope and swing down and we have, uh, you know, we have nets down here, we'll catch you, you'll be saved. And the man's up there and the fire, the fire is raging in the building and they say, look, don't you believe us? All you need to do is grab hold of the rope and come down and we have you. And he says, yes, I believe you. I'm just not sure I trust you. See, there's a big difference between intellectual mind games we can play with ourselves and religious mind games we can play with. Oh yeah, I believe Jesus. Do you really? Are, are you living like it? Are you giving like it? Are you witnessing like it? You know, almost every time the term is used in the New Testament to believe, it, it's paired with a preposition that means into. Believe into Jesus. It's not like, oh yeah, he's out there somewhere, I kind of theoretically. You actually put yourself into him. You actually take hold of the rope and give yourself to him. That's what the Bible is talking about. That's what we're talking about throughout every Lord's Day we gather, and certainly during this stewardship season. There's a difference between saying we love the Lord and actually loving him. Oh yeah, honey, it, it's fine. I love you. Will you marry me and actually stay committed to those covenant vows? That's a, that's a different conversation. That's real covenant love, like what the Bible talks about. So today's sermon again is trust God's plan. Trust God's plan. And uh, on that note, we'll be turning to Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah 48, verses 17 through the close of the chapter at 20, 22. Hear now God's word. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit who leads you in the way you should go. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off or destroyed from before me. Go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea. Declare with a shout of joy, proclaim it. Send it out to the end of the earth. Say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. They did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow from, for them from the rock. He split the rock and the water gushed out. There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. We will have another scripture reading kind of in the middle of the sermon here, and I want to go ahead and put you on notice. You need to have the sermon notes because it's right there kind of above the fold. I'll have you stand and read several passages of scripture with me in response in the middle of our sermon today. But we're going to start off with this theme, this message from God. Um, the Lord says, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. Winsome Sears, what a name, Winsome, right? That's what we're called to be as Christians, to be uh, not ob obnoxious witnesses for Jesus, but instead to be winsome witnesses for Jesus. Winsome Sears was elected uh, this past week, I don't know if you saw the news, as the Lieutenant Governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Now, let me tell you a little bit about Winsome Sears. I'm going to talk about a couple of people from the news this week that their stories and their testimonies hit me. When, when Winsome Sears was six years old, 
She was a little Jamaican girl. She and her family immigrated legally uh, to the United States, and her, her daddy moved them to the Bronx, to a tough area of the Bronx. Uh, by the time he had paid for and arranged for them to travel to the Bronx, uh, in his first day in the United States of America, after arriving in the Bronx, Winsome Sears' dad had a dollar seventy-five to his name. A dollar seventy. I'm, I'm just going to guess most of you and most of, most of you watching. Hey, you've got an electronic device. You probably have more than a dollar seventy-five to your name. But you know what? He had faith. He was a strong Christian, and he believed that God had called him to the United States of America, and he wanted to pursue education and advancement for himself and for his children, because his idea was the education and the the possibilities for people, regardless of your race, skin, color, background, are the greatest in the United States and anywhere in the world. That was what he believed. Can you think of it? The best education in the world available in the United States of America. Well, he pursued his education. He took all kinds of jobs, a combination of jobs, making virtually what we would consider nothing. And he worked his way up. And, and, and Winsome followed suit. She worked her way through high school, you know, a lot of disadvantages as a Jamaican girl background, but she made it all the way through. She graduated from high school. Can you imagine that? And after graduating from high school, she enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. Now, we're, we're going to recognize that this is Veterans Week, so I thought this was kind of cool. This is a Marine veteran uh, who was able to then go on and get a community college degree um, and a college, a full university degree, and a graduate degree kind of bridging off of her service in the United States Marine Corps. She also, as a Marine, met her uh, future husband, a fellow Marine, and they were both, they both actually served the, the Marines as electricians. And sure enough, down the road now for years, um, Winsome and her husband, Terrence, have owned and he's run a small plumbing and electrical company in Virginia, the Shenandoah Company, electrical and plumbing company. So anyway, that, that's, what, that's what they do. Now, their, their story is one of great blessing and success, but also of challenge. Uh, you may know their story. They have three children, uh, but one of their children, a daughter, uh, developed a bipolar disorder uh, by the time she was a teenager and then a young adult, lots of increasing struggles. And uh, Winsome Sears, who had been elected, upset a, a longtime incumbent Democrat in the Virginia Assembly uh, to win a seat in the Virginia Assembly, lost a later race running for U.S. Congress, and then took, took a number of years off from politics because she was trying to help and care for her now adult uh, bipolar daughter. Uh, who, by the way, had two children, and tragically, I think about 11 years ago, that daughter and her two young children were all killed in an automobile accident uh, that she had. So Winsome Sears has, has known what it is to go through challenge and grief and loss. Those of you who've lost a child, and maybe a child and grandchildren at the same time, uh, can relate to that uh, and resonate with that kind of grief. Uh, it's really unimaginable, I think, for, for most of us. But, but just last Tuesday, Winsome Sears became not just the first black woman or the first veteran woman uh, elected to the lieutenant governor position in the Commonwealth of Virginia, but in fact, the first woman, period, elected to that uh, position. And uh, she's also the first, this won't surprise you, the first uh, woman of Jamaican descent ever elected to a statewide office like this uh, in, in Virginia. She said, in her speech uh, Tuesday night when she was declared the winner, she ran in connection with her, her kind of co-running mate was a man named Glenn Youngkin who won the Virginia governorship. She said, we ran an impossible, improbable campaign. God was exactly with us. Otherwise, we would never have made it. And so I want to finish up by thanking you, Jesus, this is on national TV now. By thanking you, Jesus, how sweet it is. I focused us last week on Reformation Sunday. I want to continue to focus us through this uh, stewardship season, certainly, on that verse that every Christian should know, certainly every Christian parent should know, and be teaching your children, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him those who are called 
according to his purpose. God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him, those who are called according to his purpose. Another person in the news on a different level person, uh, but Dansby Swanson, uh, this past week and really for the last couple of weeks, I've been tracking him, you know, great college uh, baseball player who now plays for the Atlanta Braves as their starting shortstop. After his, he's from Marietta, uh, Dansby Swanson is, and when he was a one-year-old baby boy, uh, in 1995, the Atlanta Braves won, at least for the Braves, for the Atlanta Braves, when they've been in Atlanta, their only World Series championship. They won, they won a couple other times, you know, I think in, in Boston and Milwaukee. But he was one year old the last time they won the World Series, the Braves did. He grew up as a Braves fan, but he went on and played. He was a du dual sport athlete at Marietta High, star basketball player, star baseball player. He went to Vanderbilt on a baseball scholarship and was the most outstanding um, player in the 2014 World Series, College World Series. You may remember this. He led Vanderbilt to one of their national championships. And then the next year, uh, he was a finalist for the Golden Spikes and selected number one in the major league draft. Can you imagine that? Number one in the entire major league draft. But that's kind of a blessing and a curse, honestly, because if you go number one, you're a marked man. Everybody follows every strikeout, every error you make, you know, for the rest of your life. And this guy was, you know, selected number one, kind of like being recruited as a place kicker for Mississippi State, maybe. I don't know. But anyway, so people are going to pay attention to what you do, particularly they really pay attention when you mess up. Have you ever noticed that kickers don't get much credit when they, when they make it, but when they mess up and we seem to be living a lot of that lately, right? So anyway, but uh, so, uh, you know, uh, kind of a blessing and a curse. He's, he's drafted number one by the Arizona Diamondbacks as their future franchise player, like the face of the franchise. But um, about a month after he, he left Vanderbilt and is playing in the major leagues in a simulated game. Now, in a simulated game, uh, a pitcher throws a wild pitch that crashes in his face. And he was out for most of his first summer of what would have been his developmental minor league, you know, on the way quickly to the major leagues. And then six months after being selected number one, like Arizona is totally sold out on you, Dansby. You're going to Arizona. You're going to be their future for the next 20 years. They trade him for a pitcher because they needed a pitcher and it's like, well, whatever, you know, move on. They traded him though to his hometown team, the Atlanta Braves. Now fast forward, I've got several Dansby stories for you because he's a very strong Christian. He and his girlfriend, Mallory Pugh, who plays for the U.S. national soccer team, World Cup winner in 2019, Mallory Pugh. Yes, there are some strong Christian women actually on that national team too. Um, they're really strong Christians, but you know, I don't know if you saw the nationally broadcast interview after game four, after Swanson hit that home run and kind of turned the game around and the Atlanta Braves went up three to one on the Houston Astros. Uh, he told the Fox station, you know, this is the national broadcast of the World Series immediately, you know, on the field right after the game. Uh, the, the, the interviewer said, hey, it's really great for you to be playing for your hometown team, isn't it, for the Braves? And I'm, I'm sure that that was really a blessing or an exciting thing for you when you got traded. And he said, actually, no, getting traded over here at the time, I didn't really understand it. I was devastated. But then he said this on national TV, Swanson did. God's always got a plan. And if I've learned one thing, it's having faith in that plan will never fail you. It's one of the best things that ever happened to me. In other words, the disappointment of being traded. God worked through it. And then he went on to say, now I get to, you know, see my niece and nephew grow up. I'm in Atlanta. Uh, I wouldn't have met Mallory, his Christian soccer star girlfriend, except through Christian friends after he moved back to Atlanta. So he was giving testimony of that. But, th but that made me think about and go back to look at some earlier interviews he had. And honestly, I could share a whole lot, but just a few of them. Uh, he, he emphasized back in 2018, after a really hard 2017 year, he said, when everything is going well, you don't often make adjustments. Failure teaches you so much. God's timing is everything. He said, there's so many things I can start to list out that God's timing is everything. And my struggling last year with his baseball, but I'm so tremendously thankful that I went through it. 
it's such a blessing, the fact that we're even alive. And then he, he got really philosophical and says, the odds of your even being born are ridiculous. In other words, it's a total miracle that, that, that the world exists and that human beings exist and certainly that you exist. After Swanson, you know, went on in game six to hit that kind of game clinching, uh, put the game out of reach home run, that monster hit that he had off the, the high wall uh, in game six. And then Swanson made the final out, you know, at shortstop to put the game away uh, to give the Braves their first World Series championship since he was a little baby boy. Uh, he, he again was the guy, you know, interviewed on the field immediately following the game. And the, the, the interviewer for Fox asked um, what it felt like. Why, how he thought this had come together. And he said, destiny, I guess, the good Lord, he's blessed me so much. I wouldn't be here without him. Just the peace that he gives me, it's remarkable. Especially in moments like this, you can never go wrong trusting him. You can never go wrong trusting. I'm just so thankful to be here. Isaiah 48, 17, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. So for the sermon points today, we've got three of them. Trust God's plan, pay attention. Number one, trust God's plan, pay attention. Moving on to Isaiah 48. Uh, 18 and 19, verses 18 and 19. Now, do some of you like the beach? Some of you like the beach? I think some of you do. Some of you like the sea. You like the, 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 the particular locations where a river goes into a sea. That's a really gorgeous combination, isn't it? Well, that's what Isaiah is picturing here. So just, just hear this. And God is picturing through Isaiah. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river. Craig, a lot of songs written off of this now. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Your offspring would have been like sand. You see this, this picture, can you hear this picture? And remember the prophecy to Abraham that his descendants would be like the sand, okay? It, uncountable. Uh, your, your offspring would have been like the sand and your descendants like its grains. Their name would never be cut off are destroyed from before me. So the takeaway here is to focus on God's word and follow God's word. Focus on God's word and follow God's word. Again, one more Dansby story, Dansby Swanson. He, he talked um, heading into this season, which ended up with, you know, World Series championship, but Early in the season, he did interviews where he talked about how heading into this year, he's always been a strong Christian, but he really got focused this year on doing a devotional with the team chaplain and with his girlfriend, uh, with, with Dansby's girlfriend, Mallory Pugh, with Braves team chaplain, Terry Evans. He started doing then something that he hadn't done before, which is remember the scripture and meditate on the scripture all through the day, including when he's playing in baseball games. Okay. So he started doing that this year. He'd never really done that before. And he says, the lesson that I've learned was that you can't go wrong trusting and growing closer to God. You're getting a theme here from Dansby Swanson. He is really into this trust thing. Um, you can't go wrong trusting and growing closer to God. Whatever way that works for you, in other wor words, whatever way gets you to actually read the Bible and think about God every day, okay? whatever way works for you, but spend time with God legitimately spend time in the words that he wrote through people that were on this earth. Spend time in prayer and meditating on his word in silence. Do these things to grow nearer to God. He says when he began to spend real time with God, I mean, really thinking about God's word all through the day, I really started to feel his presence more and to feel more comfortable with the callings he's placed on my heart. Focus on God's word and follow, live by God's word. Now, secondly, trust God's plan, go out, go out. And you need to get ready because this is our responsive reading thing. I'm gonna read a first verse from Isaiah and then I want you to see with these other verses how later prophets, Jeremiah, 
John in the book of the Revelation and Zechariah all kind of echo off of what God says through Isaiah about going out from Babylon. So Isaiah 48, 20, the opening part of it, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea. Now you all stand and I want you to read through these uh, with me, these other verses. You see they're in sequence here from Jeremiah and Revelation and then ultimately Zechariah too. Y'all read them with me now. Flee from the midst of Babylon and go out from the land of the Chaldeans. For behold, I am stirring up and bringing against Babylon a gathering of great nations from the north country. That's Jeremiah 50. Now, moving on to Jeremiah 51. Flee from the midst of Babylon. Let everyone save his life. Be not cut off in her punishment. For this is the time of the Lord's vengeance, the repayment he is rendering her. And then, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. And then, up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. That's from Zechariah 2, 7. Thanks for reading those, y'all may be seated, or remain standing if you'd like. <laughs> Okay, so what I want you to get on this is, you see how this is a theme and a call and a command that runs all through Scripture from Isaiah forward all the way through the close of the New Testament. And it, it's, it's to leave Babylon, and then you see it in the Zechariah. Well, where are we supposed to go? You need to go to Zion, okay? So both trust moves are key. It's like the guy in the, the fire burning, you know, even if he grabs the rope, where is he supposed to go, right? So... Uh, both trust moves are essential. Leave Babylon, number one, and number two, come home, come home. Beloved, child, son, daughter, come home to God, to Zion, okay? So, um, so number one, first, leave Babylon. And I know you could say to me, but pastor, Pastor Martin, I don't live in Iraq right now. I've never even been to Iraq, probably most of you never even been to Iraq. And I could say, well, actually, okay, well, it's Egypt too. You know, in the Bible, Babylon represents all the way from the Tower of Babel. Okay, it's the same place as Babylon, right? Tower of Babel, all the way through Babylon in Isaiah and all through the Old Testament, all the way through Revelation. Babylon represents the city of man and man's glory and sin. That's what Babylon represents, okay? So you don't have to travel to, and then by the way, Egypt also represents that kind of as a locale, as a nation. So you got the, the Fertile Crescent, right? You got Babylon over here, Tigris and Euphrates, you got the Nile and Egypt, and then right in the middle, you got that little bitty place called Israel. And they're supposed to trust in the Lord and in his little city of Jerusalem, not nearly as sophisticated and as impressive as Babylon, okay? We're supposed to get that. You don't have to go to the Middle East or live in Iraq to get the message. You're supposed to be moving out of Babylon. In fact, you're supposed to flee Babylon and all the seductions of this age of man in which we live. Okay, that's what the Bible is talking about. And, and to make this really clear, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul actually talks about this. He's applying it to this imagery that you're getting in Isaiah, not only about Babylon, but also about the Exodus and how God's gonna provide for you in the desert, right? It's, it's moving out of Egypt. Paul is talking about the move out of Egypt and for the, the generation that's brought out, and he applies it to us. He's talking about how we're not supposed to grumble, we're supposed to stay faithful. The generation that was delivered out of Egypt was not so. And he says this, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, picking up at verse 11. Now, these things happen to them. In other words, the sinful generation after the Exodus, and by the way, you could say also Isaiah's generation too, dealing with Assyria and Babylon. Now, these things happen to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction. Do you see that? For our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, 
let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he falls. In other words, you're probably in bed with Babylon too. You claim you're not, but you probably are. This is what Paul is saying. You need to be careful about this. No temptation, this is where this verse comes from. It's from this passage, from this conversation. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. Get out of Babylon, okay? Get out of bed with the whore of Babylon. That's what God is saying. He will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it, the temptation. Verse 14, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Again, you could say, well, I don't have little like figures that I carry around. Well, you probably do actually. But beyond that, everything that puts something in front of God is idolatry. Everything that knocks him down from the throne of your life and puts even your own children. I mean, you can be idolatrous about your own children. Let's face it. You can be idolatrous about your own stuff. Flee idolatry. Get out of Babylon. Okay? You need to come to the city of God. So come home to Zion. But literally, historically right now, uh, at the time certainly that Isaiah is foreseeing, both even under the, the, the shadow of Assyria, Jerusalem is weak. And then later, what Isaiah is kind of foreseeing or God is telling through him is the destruction of Jerusalem, right? During the Babylonian period. Jerusalem is a ruin. You want me to leave Babylon and go to a ruin? And God says, yes, I redeem ruins. Are you dealing with ruins in your own life? In maybe your household? In your soul? In your marriage? God redeems ruin. I mean, he raises the dead. So God can redeem ruins. He has redeemed everyone who loves him. He's already done it in Jesus. It's already done. Accept it and receive it. Okay? So come home to Zion. Leave Babylon. Get out before the judgment falls and come home to Zion. And then finally, trust God's plan. Profit in God's peace. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Now, God keeps calling himself in this section of Isaiah, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, because he's going to send the servant for our redemption. Okay? And remember, the word for redemption here means not just kind of vague Savior. He is a kinsman Redeemer. He's related to us. He's covenanted to us. He's married to us. He's, he's blood with us. And he sends Jesus in that way. I mean, Jesus is actually flesh and blood with us. Okay? He's the kinsman redeemer. That, that's what's prophesied all through the Old Testament and the provision for kinsman redeemers. And then that's what Jesus is called. So God says, I'm your kinsman redeemer. I'm, I'm sold out to you. And he's the holy one. So he's totally above us and beyond us. But he's the holy one of Israel. He condescends to be in relationship with Israel and with all his people. Isn't that awesome? So he uses that title and he says, I'm the redeemer. You know, I'm your redeemer, the holy one of Israel. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you in the way you should go. And then he says, declare it, shout with joy about this. I mean, proclaim it to the rooftops. And finally, what are we supposed to proclaim and what are we supposed to live? We'll keep talking about this, but it's God's harvest law. And the harvest law is this. Number one, plant in trust. Plant in trust and reap a fruitful harvest. Give in trust and reap heavenly blessings. Trust in his word and reap, receive eternal life. Yeah, this is a, this God's harvest law runs all through the Bible. If we're Christians, we're supposed to understand this and live like this. I mean, what we do, what we give matters. There's this harvest principle here. Galatians 6, 7 and 8, God's word says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that shall he also reap. Let me repeat that. Whatever you sow, you will also reap. For the one who sows unto his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. In other words, you indulge yourself in life. You use all your time, your money for yourself. I mean, it's, it's just going to hell. I mean, that's what this just said. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Plant in trust leads to a fruitful harvest. You know, 
a friend of mine was just asking me recently, what's the difference between justification and sanctification? And, and the thing is, a lot of Christians just think, well, the whole point is just to get saved. No, no, no. Salvation and justification are just the beginning, the ground of a life of fruitfulness so that God, you know, the, the New Testament is focused on us bearing fruit, right? That's sanctification. I mean, the way we tithe and give, the way we witness to other people, the way we uh, parent our children in a godly way, the way we make choices with our time and our hearts, this is all a matter of fruitfulness, okay? So that's the life of salvation in Jesus is called to be a life of not only justification, but increasing holy growth. How are you growing right now? Plant in trust and you will reap blessings eternal. Likewise, give in trust and the harvest is heavenly, okay? Malachi 3.10, bring the full tenth into God's house, into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, says the Lord, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour out for you blessings until there is no need into eternity. Do you believe him? Or are you just saying you believe and not actually taking hold of his grace? Jesus puts it this way about our giving, you know, what we give to his mission, to the church. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with, Jesus says this now, for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And then, of course, trust in his word. This is the way of life. Romans 10, 17. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Jesus tells a parable of a sower. What is the sower spreading? Seed, what does the seed represent? The word of God. Are you trusting the word of God and is it bringing forth fruit in your heart, in your family, in your life? I pray that you will turn and open yourself to trust him and his word. I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you, in the way you should go. Come with him now and forever. Get out of Babylon. Come home to Zion. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we come before you and we, Lord, acknowledge your grace and we rejoice in you. And I pray for anyone here, Lord, who, Lord, truly is not trusting in you that they would know that you are a redeemer. You can redeem even ruins. You can turn our lives around. And Lord, that you can, Lord, save our souls, that we would trust in you. And Lord, for those of us who play at being a Christian, but the truth is our witness and our giving <laughs> reflect that we are, uh, Lord, we're, we're sowing in the world and unto our flesh instead of unto you. Lord, I pray that you would call us to real repentance and real salvation that you would be first in our hearts and with our hands and with all that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are blessed uh, to come before the Lord and sing our closing hymn now, O God, our help in ages past. And as we do, we're also gonna, in, in a moment, recognize our veterans. But first, let's stand and uh, sing hymn 122, O God, our help in ages past.
I want to invite Craig and our choir to lead us in a recognition of our veterans. And as, they, as the choir comes up, let me go ahead and I will extend the blessing to you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace now and forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This week our country will recognize our veterans. And as we sing America the Beautiful, we'd like to ask those of you who are veterans or close relatives of veterans to remain standing if everyone else would have a seat as we honor our veterans. <laughs> 